I'm honored to be here. Uh, John has been a guy at Tex and Luke and everybody. Uh, the people that I've looked up to, they, they do such a great job. Uh, so, as a coach, working with athletes, I've never really understood why they're not as invested in their own development as I am as, in their development as a coach. But it's, it's the athletes like John that pour so much into it, and then more importantly, after they're done, share those experiences with others. And so somebody that studies culture and sees this community me, that's been created is phenomenal. And so I appreciate uh, the, the invite, and uh, thank you so much for what you guys did. So what you're looking at here, this is Northeast High School. This is inner city, Kansas City. Uh, I grew up single parent, five kids. My dad was a uh, UDT in Vietnam, so early Navy SEALs. Um, came back with a post-traumatic stress disorder and drug and alcohol problem. And so, uh, in and out of our lives, was pretty, put us in a pretty bad spot as a family, as a young child. You know, my mom, we, we had five kids, um, all within six years of one another. And, uh, and so this high school here, this, North, this Northeast High School, my recollection of this high school was that there was a police car and an ambulance there every single day. That was what I remember about it when I would walk home. In fact, when I went to go find this picture of Northeast High School, this is a news emblem right here, and they had had a hostage situation. This is like five years ago. So it's still not, too, it's still not a great place to be. Over in the corner, this is the middle school, and then the elementary school was right here. And so normally on a day, this is, I was probably seven, eight years old, I would walk down this street to a main street, walk up, and my house was back over here. And that would be the way that I walked, because it was main streets, and it, you know, it was the safest that I felt um, walking home. And this particular day, I get to about right here uh, at the corner, and there was a drug deal kind of going back, you know, to kind of... Um, groups of people, I don't know if they were gangs or what they were, but they were, they were, you know, pulling out knives and they were, you know, going back and forth and I just didn't feel quite safe. And so instead of walking that direction, I walked down this street right here and I walked to about this point right there. Now, when you're seven, eight years old, walking a different direction, you might as well be walking in another country, right? You know, I, I, you know, I've never been that way. And we, and as, as, a, as a poor family, I'd never really been around an organized sport. I'd never seen it. But this particular day, there was a football practice going on, and I was captivated. I was blown away by the symphony of it all. The coach was screaming, the players training, hundred something players running around, it's coordinated, it's orchestrated. I was, I, mean, I was blown away by it. So being seven to eight years old and not having any boundaries, I walked right down the middle of this field in the middle of practice. And uh, guys are dodging me, play, you know, they're running plays around me. And I want you to put yourself in that coach's position. How many coaches do we have in the, in the room? How many want to be, uh, that one are conspiring to be like one coaches? Pretty much the entire room. That coach that day, if it was you know, most of us, right, and you've got a, a seven or eight year old kid walking down the middle of practice, what would you normally do? Anybody, this is the interactive part. Get the fuck off the field. Yeah, get the hell out of here, right? <laughs> You'd probably kick the kid off the, off the field. And instead, that day, that coach walked me to the sideline and sat me down and let me watch practice. You know, just took me by the hand. I was probably upset. Walked me over, let me sit down and watch practice. And about halfway through practice, he got the quarterback's attention and he had him throw me in football. Now, again, didn't have a dad really growing up. Hadn't really been around organized sport, play in the backyard and all that kind of stuff, but you know, they like, put your hands up. So I put my hands up. They throw the ball, it seemed like a mile. It's like, oh, that's awesome, right? I'm watching the ball, it seemed like this incredible throw. Ball goes right through my hands, hits me in the nose, and bloodies my nose. And I thought it was the freaking coolest thing in the world. I thought it was the best thing ever. And from that moment on, I wanted to be that quarterback, I wanted to be that player. Uh, and so it's still, to this day, I'm 40, 44 years old, Still to this that day, my mom sends me a Nerf football for Christmas every year. So it was that impactful to me, right? And so I say that because 
From that decision, I decided to be, I wanted to be an NFL football player. That was my goal of life. Um, and I didn't, as seven, eight years old, I didn't start playing organized football until eighth grade because my, we just couldn't afford it. We just, we just didn't. Fought my way onto an eighth grade football team. I think I was scholarshiped onto it through my, through my church. Um, worked my way through high school. Remember being the, the, the eighth quarterback in a line of eight. Um, worked my way to get the college scholarship to Ottawa University and playing football there. Now, through that, moved my shoulder, moved to defense, and uh, went on and I ended up getting a couple tryouts in the NFL, but it didn't, didn't pan out. That's not, that was not the path for me. But if I wasn't going to make it as a player, I decided to make it as a coach at that point. I stayed on for a year. I coached at Ottawa, defensive backs. While I was doing that, I was working for the Kansas City Royals as an intern. From the Kansas City Royals, I went to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. First shot, 20 years old. Uh, worked my way from an intern to a part-time assistant to a full-time assistant. And from there, I became the head strength coach at 21 years old in NFL Europe. NFL Europe led to 10 years at the University of South Florida, Army Special Operations, University of Tennessee, Cincinnati Bengals, Eastern Michigan, and now at play, I have worked with teams all around the world. I have 29 of the Chinese Olympic teams, I have two professional rugby teams in Australia, I have a professional lacrosse team. Uh, I literally get to travel the world and work with athletes and coaches all over the place. And I tell you that not because I want you to think about how cool this journey is. I tell you that because none of that is possible my life wasn't changed for the better without a coach grabbing me by the hand and walking me to the sideline. And I like to remind that as I start off this presentation and start talking about culture, I like to remind everybody in this room that you have the opportunity every single day, every single day that you walk into the gym, you have the opportunity to make that type of impact on the people around you. Every single day, you don't even know what decision that's going to be. You never know what action that's going to be. But if you wake up every single day and you attack the day that way, Big things can happen. Big things that can change somebody's life. Now, through this journey that I've been on for the last 25 years, I've experienced the highs and the lows. I've been on a two and 10 football team. I've been on championship teams. I've worked with gold medalists, and I've worked with athletes that have had people, the, the agony of, not, of missing going to the Olympic Games. The deciding factor between all of that Everywhere I've ever been, it isn't just the talent that you, you have. It isn't the resources that you have. And it it's ultimately come down to culture. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. So as I started my journey, um, being young and dumb, being, you know, not having a whole lot of mentors at 21 years old and leading the program, you know, I felt like I had all the answers, especially early on in my career. Um, and it wasn't really until I read this quote one day that it really dawned on me that sometimes it's not just me, it needs to be we, right? So for some things to change, somebody somewhere has to start acting differently. Maybe it's you, or maybe it's your team. I think as coaches, sometimes we always point to our team, or the athletes that we work with, being the people that have to change. And sometimes it really comes back to the person that you look at yourself in the mirror. And that was something that I really had to uh, grasp hold of to become the kind of coach that I wanted to be. You know, I'd inspired, I was always chasing greatness, I always wanted success. Uh, that was something that I chased early on in my career. It wasn't until I was allowed myself to be vulnerable and start to share the ups and downs and the challenges of my life that I started to develop the relationships with the athletes that I wanted to have to make the impact that I wanted to be. To be. So how many people have read any of Chip and Dan East's work? Handful, handful of people. Chip and Danny, uh, they've written four books. They've written uh, Decisive, is all about the decision-making process. The Power of Moments is all about elevating everyday moments. Uh, Made the Stick is all about giving kind of sticky presentations. And this book, Switch, is probably the best book on culture I've ever read. Um, those four books are in my top five for any coach to read. When, I, when people ask me what books to read, those five are it. It isn't Zatsy or, or or Cal Deeds or, or whatever, Joe Kitt, it's not any of that. It's, it's those books because ultimately that's going to decide whether or not you have the impact that you want to have. So in that book, they give this visual. And this visual, if you take this away, 
uh, in this talk, I think when we talk culture, um, it's easy to identify good culture. When I walk into this room, I see a great culture. It's easy to identify, right? You can also identify bad culture. It's pretty easy to do. What people don't do is they don't teach you how to develop that, right? And ultimately, that's going to stand in the way of you having success. And so I think, just like with everything, whether or not you're a tier system or triphasic or uh, fluid periodization or linear periodization or building periodization, a framework is a safe place for coaches. And so today, I want to, I want to give you Chip and Dan Heath's framework and how I've applied it to my coaching career. And it all comes back to this, this visual right here. If you can remember this, you'll remember the framework. A man riding down uh, an elephant down a path. The man represents the rational mind. The elephant re represents the emotional side, and the path is the situational world. And those are the three elements. When you're trying to affect culture, change culture, you need to be speaking to all three of these. So in short, you have to do three things. You have to direct the rider, you have to motivate the elephant, and you have to shape the path. So let's talk a little bit about these and break these down. Directing the rider, so think man on top of an elephant, the rational mind. First thing you want to do when you're trying to speak to the rational mind, and think about this for a second. If you're, if you're riding an elephant and you want to go right, but that elephant wants to go left, which way are you going? You're going left, right? It doesn't matter anything. So we as coaches, so many times, we want to speak to that rational mind and say, hey, doing squats is good. This is why doing squats is good. Now go do squats. And for some reason, that's not registered with our athletes, right? They're not picking it up when you put it out. And so you have to be able to speak. You still have to give them the information. I was talking to Josh last night. Uh, I'll probably reference him a couple of times because it was really impactful. But with, with, with the Navy SEALs, I'm talking about, you know, when they go through buds, they strip them away of some decision making, which is another tactic. But then they also educate while they're doing that so that they can empower them to have the, the skill set to make their own decisions in the field later on. It gets super important. So, so many times, um, back in, this is 1980, I believe, the World Health Organization, um, there's, a, there's a village in Vietnam that was on the brink of extinction, extinction this, this tribal group. And so you think about 1980, that's not too long ago, right? There's no way should somebody be going extinct, the people be going extinct because of any kind of modern um, food preparation or, or uh, anything along those lines. And this village was on the, on the brink, and they had sent 10 groups into this village. And all 10 groups went in, and all 10 groups failed. One group would go in and talk about the irrigation. One group would go in and talk about the way the, field was, uh, the, the food was prepped. One would go in there and talk tactics on how they farmed the food, you know, and those types of things or how they manage disease. And all 10 failed. And, they were, and, the, and, the, and this is how bad it got. The World Health Organization was about to give up on this trial and let them go and stay. And it wasn't until there was an 11th group that went in, and it was actually a bunch of students. It wasn't even professors that a bunch of students had asked to do it. And they went in, and instead of looking for all the bad things, all the bad things. What they did is they went and they identified the bright spots. One family out of this tribe was a little bit more plump than the other. One family seemed to have a little bit more food than another. Somebody's crops were being developed a little bit better than another. And I think so many times, especially in my situation, think about it, you know, you're going to an NFL team, you're going to a major college program, an Olympic team, you're there because somebody failed to get the job done typically, right? Somebody got fired and you're coming in, and it's easy to go in and be the savior and say, oh, what? they weren't showing up for workouts, that's why. Or they weren't doing, you know, they weren't doing this exercise, that's why. And so many times when you come in like that, your team, your athletes will tune you out, you know, for the most part, because there's a good portion of them looking around at themselves saying, I know how hard we work. I know what we do, you know? Maybe it was this, maybe it was that. Maybe they were little external, so there's positive, negative asymmetry that exists, right? Sometimes we, we always look for the negative instead of identifying the positive. And I think that's super important whenever you go into a situation. You have to find what's working and elevate it. As a coach, if you are so rigid 
that they have to conform to you, then you're not a very good coach. Period. A coach is leading somebody on a journey. That's the, the definition of the term, right? You have to be the adaptable one. You have the resources. You have the toolbox to be able to adapt. You have to be the one to be able to take them on that journey, not the other way around. So we need to, we need to take that rider, we need to direct that rider towards a solution. But the way that that group really ultimately had success was they brought all those people together. They empowered them to educate the rest of the tribe. And within 10 years, they're a thriving, they're a thriving tribe there in Vietnam. So brink of extinction to success just by identifying the right spot. Pretty, pretty valuable. Next, you have the script, the critical moves. So this is, again, going back to my conversation with Josh last night. You know, there's, there's this decision paralysis that exists. As coaches, when we come in and we start talking, acting, and Maya said, and Maya Fibrils, and you know, um, all the different scientific terms that we want to throw out there, there's a switch that goes off that all of a sudden now you, you throw too many solutions at somebody and they panic. Think about it, so my wife recently bought a, a new car. And so it was like, it was our first like real car, like we're finally at a point where like we can buy real stuff as adults. And so I'm like, get whatever you want, man, right? Go in there, get whatever you want. So we walk and we go through all these and it's like, I don't know. And then when she gets down to like um, this Cadillac SUV that she wanted, and it was black or white. I'm like, I don't care, get one. I'm tired of walking around this. So we get the black one, right? And we drive off, and like, not a block away, but she's like, should I have gotten the white? You know, so it's that decision, it's, it's that decision paralysis that exists. And it's the same thing with our athletes. When we start throwing a lot of these complex solutions at them, oh, we need to do this, and oh, by the way, we need to do that, and oh, by the way, we need to do this with nutrition, and then sleep, and then, you gotta do all those things. There's a decision paralysis that takes place and, and they get frightened. Think about an elephant, the emotional side, getting frightened by the little mouse, right? It's a very similar concept. So what I tend to do with my athletes is when I first get a hold of them, I remove the decision-making process. It is very simple. You don't have a, you don't have a say. You don't have a say. This is what we're gonna do. This is how we're gonna do it. This is when we're gonna do it and we do it. As we go along, I go from coach-led to player-led, and we start empowering them to make decisions throughout the process. Now, instead of, okay, multiple drone lower body movement's gonna be a bilateral squat, it may be, okay, what do you want to do? Do you wanna do an overhead squat? Do you wanna do a front squat? Do you wanna do a research squat? What do we wanna do? What, what's gonna accomplish your goals the best? As we go. So we have to be, you know, we, we have to basically provide them the roadmap for them to follow, for them to have the confidence to make the decisions themselves. Lastly here, you gotta to point to a destination. I think one of the things as coaches, as we've gone, we, 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 have, we have not developed the skill of having difficult conversations. And I think that's probably one of the most important skills as a coach that you can have is the ability to sit down in front of somebody and let them know at the same time that you're being empathetic that this is what you have to change about yourself to get to where you want to be. You have to define good. You have to, you have to clearly define that, whatever that might be. So with our athletes, this is an example. And again, I don't want to get caught up in what the NFL numbers are, but what I would do for our players, is this is the NFL combine numbers. In college football, I don't know if John's still in here, uh, but look, I don't care if you're at Tennessee or you're at the NAI school, every single one of them thinks they're going to the NFL. Every single one. In fact, I would give our athletes a questionnaire at the end of the, at the, end of the year when I was at South Florida. Ten years of data. And I would say, not do you think that you will go to the NFL, but do you think that you are an NFL player? And only in, in ten years, I only had two players that they weren't, and both of those guys got drafted. <laughs> so, it's kind of a, it's a weird dichotomy, right? But they all think that. Now, I can be the coach, being, having coached for 25 years, right, and coached at that level. I, can, I have a pretty good eye of knowing whether or not they're going to make it to the NFL pretty quick. And I can come in as a freshman or sophomore, and I can say, you're not going to make it. I don't care how hard you try because you're five foot six and you're 150 pounds, and this is what an NFL player looks like, right? 
But rather than do that, I'd much rather be a dream builder than a dream killer. If you would have told me, even at NAI school, that I wasn't going to play in the NFL as a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, you would have been dead to me as a coach. That would have not, I, I would not have listened to you. But instead, instead of saying you can't, this is how you can. This is how you can. So now, when I tell them that the NFL combine average for uh, an offensive tackle in the NFL is doing 20, 225 to 26 reps, and you're doing two, and you're drinking, uh, oh, uh, dancing over at the water cooler when we're benching, that becomes a little bit easier conversation to walk over and say, didn't you tell me that you want to go to the NFL? Well, this is, this, like, is this going to help us get the 26 reps? No. And so now I become not the person that's killing their dreams, but I now become the only person in the building that can help them get their dreams. Right? I'm the only one that can help them get the 26 reps. I become a pretty powerful spot to be in as a coach. So I give them the average. The average is the top 5% of college football. Here's the range, because I don't want them to be so discouraged that they, they're like, oh, there's 26 reps, I'm doing two. I'll never make it. So they're, you know, we'll show the high and the low. This is where they're currently at. This is where they reported at. This is where they're currently at. And this is their goal for that training period. And then we track that over time, of course. And again, this is just becomes a tool to put in front of them when we need it. All right, so the more important part here and the really challenging part in this, in this framework is motivating the elephant. We're getting into the, the emotional side of things. First thing you have to do here is you have to grow your people. You have to make them better people. I, I, I'm a firm believer that all the talent in the world, I've been around the very best. If they're not good people, they're not going to have a sustainable career in sport. They're just not. It's too hard. It is way too hard. So how many people have seen this target from Simon Sinek? Start with why. Everybody likes that book, right? I love that book. I, I think it's a great book. If you haven't read it, read it. If you, if you, if you want to cheat, watch the TED Talk. Okay? Either way, he gives this framework of to, to motivate somebody, you have to know their why so that you can determine the how and the what. And it's a really cool little cute bullseye that a lot of people throw up on the screen and they just say, find their why. If I asked everybody in this room what your why is, why you coach, why you work with people, it's probably going to be a pretty superficial answer, isn't it? I want to make an impact. That's why I do it. That's about it. That's, we kind of took a straw poll out, but that's going to be. Really wouldn't tell me a whole lot. To me, it's important to, to have some questions that you can ask. So one of the things that I do with our athletes is I have a medical chart. You guys remember the old medical charts when you go to the doctors? It's got the two whole prong deals, right? On the front cover, the inside cover, back inside and back cover, I list like 500 questions that we have to get answered on every athlete. What's your favorite color? What's your favorite movie? What's, how, many, how many siblings do you have? Who's your favorite coach? It's a million questions so that we can get to know them outside of just who they, you know, who they are. But in an initial meeting, when I first meet with them, I ask them three questions. And before we get to these three questions, Carol DeWitt, anybody familiar with you know, like self-determination theory, right, and, and growth mindset? To me, that, Growth mindset and growth mindset. If you don't believe, it's, it's very easy in my, in my environment for a coach to come downstairs and say, oh, we missed on that kid, he's, a, he's a terrible, we'll recruit over him next year. Very, very kind, or we'll draft over him next year, right? And to me, that's a, that's a fixed mindset, right? You don't believe that you can make a change. If you are in this room and you're coaching somebody and you have a fixed mindset, Get out of coaching. You don't belong in it. You need to have a growth mindset. You gotta feel like you can make a change, and you can. And you can. There's too many examples of how that's been the case. But you have to have the ability to, to, to think that way. All right, getting back to those three questions. I, I, I call this my why meeting now. Before the book, I would just be a meeting. Half the meeting was talking about their goals. Half a minute is talking about their why. I'd ask them three questions. I'd write these down. First, if you weren't a football player, golfer, tennis player, firefighter, nurse, whatever, what would you do? What would you do? We were talking about this a little bit last night. 
Um, most athletes have never thought about their mortality in the sport. They've never even considered it. You know, myself, John, I would venture to say, uh, Kyle, you never thought about life after football, especially as a sophomore, junior, or senior. Getting to their why is super important. I had an athlete tell me that he wanted to sail around the world. After, you got to dig, right? You got to dig on it. But I don't want to tell me that he wanted to sail around the world. And our, our head coach was a sailor, and I was able to connect him on a little bit different path, right? I had another one that said I wanted to be an ESPN broadcaster. Much long time after I played in the NFL, like 10 years I played in the NFL, I would be an ESPN broadcaster. And we sat there and we talked, and in that meeting I told him that I had a podcast. I think at that time it was, I don't know, four or five years. I think it's been eight or nine now. Um, I told him that I became a better interviewer by doing podcasts. And so the kid started a podcast. He ended up interviewing with other people in the conference. And when football didn't work out, like he thought it would, he was able to go on the ESPN interview with uh, like 50 episodes, and he's now an ESPN broadcaster, right? Getting to their why, what they want to do with their life. Most of the athletes, they want to go back to their community. They want to make it a difference somehow, some way. Knowing that makes me a better coach. Next question, what's the most difficult thing you've ever been through? I had an athlete, Howard Campbell. He's now a, a neurosurgeon. Pretty impressive guy, super impressive guy. Wasn't until I asked him this question in a, in a, in a meeting that we learned as a, as a football staff. All we knew about him was that he lived with grandma and we recruited him. And that his life, his, his life story wasn't great. That's all we knew about him. Wasn't until I asked him this question that I learned that he sat there and he watched his dad shoot his mom and commit suicide right in front of him and go into um, foster care for about 10 years, and it wasn't until his grandma, who was an alcoholic, thought and thought, was told that he was going to have go get a college scholarship in football, that he might make the NFL, that she'd take him out of foster care and take care of him. It wasn't until that, now look, am I gonna am I gonna motivate that kid by screaming and yelling? That kid, he's seen the worst that's ever gonna happen. Right? I can't frame it any worse than that. Right? That kid needs somebody to love on him, and somebody needs to put, put his arm around him. Makes me a better coach. Lastly, who's the most influential person in your life? I, I don't say that because I, I want to, I don't <coughs> just say it because I want to know, even though I do, I think it's cool, right? Pastor, coach, brother, uncle, whatever, right? But what I do is I get the permission from the player to call that person and, and, and just have a conversation. And so, you guys have all been in college. What happens when mom or dad or pastor or brother or whoever gets a call from the college? What do they think? What? Yeah, oh no, exactly. They're in trouble, right? And instead of that, I make sure that the very first thing that I say is something positive about the kid. I make sure that I, I, I watched him, you know, carry five things up these, you know, flights of stairs for this lady. He must have learned that from somebody. He must have learned that from you. And oh, by the way, did you know that you're the most influential person in his life? Because as, as humans, we're really good about telling people that, right? The people that are most important to us, we're usually pretty good about telling them how important they are to us. And so usually after a bunch of crying, you know, we have a great conversation. We hang up the phone. What do you think happens next? They call the kid, right? They call the kid. And so now... As their coach, I have the most influential person in their life calling them, signing off on me as a coach, saying, man, that coach cares about you. You think that's important? Super, super important. You know? And, and, and to me now, it becomes less about screaming and yelling and getting in somebody's face about arbitrary or superficial goals. It really comes back to now, we had Derek Brook, um, Raph and I work together at Tampa. And we had Derek Brooks, who probably would both agree is one of the best people in the world, right? His most ultimate motivation in life was providing for his kids. He takes uh, uh, his family and 10 other kids to Africa every year um, as part of, the, of a missions trip. And so when we were sitting there and we would train him, we would talk about Deontay and Keon and say, hey, 
How about you get 13th rep for Keon? And how about you get 14th rep for Dante? And the guy would kill himself. Like, he would have buried himself to get the rep for his kid. You know, and it was just a playful way of doing it. But, like, you tap into that for an athlete, what their ultimate goals are, you can get them to do anything. Much stronger than the stick, right? Much stronger than the stick. Next, you got to find the feeling. So, most people think that it ultimately comes back to analyze, think, change. To make a change, to, to, to have some sort of change in culture, we should be able to analyze something, think about it, right? And then change. So, drink water, drink the water is good because of all these reasons, I drank more water, right? That's not really the way that it works. It's really see, feel change. Right? I gotta feel it. I gotta feel either the, 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 the positives or the negatives. That. That's why so many of us learn from mess ups. Right? My, I got two freshmen right now uh, in college. They're learning a lot right now. You know? So, so you just gotta, you gotta you learn from mess ups. So as a coach, you gotta tap into that. You, you, and it's, it really comes back to emotion. So with emotion, you can lead negatively by the stick or the carrot, the positive, right? They both work. They both work. I use, the, I use the stick. People don't like to say that. I do. I use the stick quite a bit. But when I use the stick, and for example, if somebody was, was more than five minutes late on a workout, it was 50 up-downs for them, or I'm sorry, 100 up-downs for them, 50 up-downs for their team. If it was a second time, it was a miss. A miss no matter what the reason. You could have flipped the car off a crying baby and we're late. A miss is a miss. There's eight laps around the field, 800 yards of up-downs every, every five yards, and eight collar pushes across the field unloaded at, at 5 a.m. No matter what. So the key with negative, the stick, is that you have to be very clear and consistent with your message. You have to let them know what they are choosing to do, and then you have to be 100% consistent with it. What happens a lot of times at the high school level, or even at the college level, or even at the pro level, is this guy is scoring touchdowns, and this guy isn't, so now all of a sudden, this guy gets buried every time he messes up, and this guy gets away with murder, right? Then you have that, you lose all kinds of respect and effectiveness as a coach. So you've got to be consistent, you've got to be clear. So all the rules, all whatever your gym rules are, wherever you're at, cool. Have a consequence, be consistent, no problem, right? And they'll actually respect you for it. I can't tell you how many people I've had in my career that have thanked me after doing that and been like, yeah, coach, I messed up, I'm sorry. Won't happen again. It's such a better relationship than like being that freaking ready to, to, to come to blows over something. I much prefer the curiosity and joy. I much prefer this approach, right? So I use the stick, but I'd rather them say, man, what's Coach Matt got for me today? Then, oh man, freaking, I gotta go deal with it. If, them, if they don't know, if they're curious about what I got going on in the, in, the, in the room that day, it's a lot more fun and they're a lot more likely to buy in. So this is an example of, we, uh, I was coaching the Eastern Michigan. I spent most of my career down in, in, in Florida. Um, and uh, uh, snow was not fun. <laughs> but that year, it was like 11 degrees um, pretty consistently throughout. We had one day where it became 40 degrees when we still had all the snow on the ground. So instead of going into the bubble and doing our agilities in the bubble, I kept them outside and we did it outside of the snow. Did I give up, you know, shit angle, position, you know, the, 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 the metabolic demands of the, of the drill or the, the session? I did, but what I gained in curiosity and joy for what's going to happen session to session, super, super effective. Oops. All right, so I'm going to give you five ways to kind of create curiosity and joy. First thing is to create life experiences. And I know that sounds kind of hard to do, but there's life experiences all around, right? What I would try to do is I would always look for things within my area my sphere of things that my guys probably didn't do. So when I was at Tennessee, even though we were in state school, 
we had about five kids from Tennessee. Most of our kids were Miami, Chicago, Virginia Beach, Atlanta, big cities, never seen a mountain before, much less been on one. So I would take this as our senior class. I had to miss a workout. I had to pick a young an underclassman, and we went and we climbed Mount Lacan in Tennessee. This was when I first got to Eastern Michigan. They, um, they had a polar plunge. Now, I, I do not like the cold. <laughs> All right. But they had a polar plunge. The first year, it was pretty much the guys that you see in that picture were the only ones there. It's a sunny day, but it was still cold. It's all, you know, it's, it's all get out in the water. But we only had about five people. This year, the second year, we ended up having about 50. It was much colder that day than it was the first day. And then by the last year that I left, we had the entire team doing it. Life experience. I've never jumped in a frozen lake, neither than most of the team. It's something that we bonded on since. Being up in Michigan, we had um, sand dunes up by, off the Great Lakes. I'd never even been, I, me personally, 40 something years old, I'd never even seen a Great Lake. So we decided to, to end the workout, the, the winter off season, camping out on the beach on the Great Lake, doing a sand workout in the uh, agilities in the, in the sand, and then finishing by climbing this freaking incredible sand dune that was probably the most awful thing that I've ever done. I mean, I I mean it took a while. That's at the top of it. This was at Tennessee. We had whitewater rafting. This is a, this was a um, quarterback in the NFL. This was a first round draft pick, third round, second round, third round, fourth round. All draft picks. What's on their faces? Smiles, right? I mean, I don't know about you guys, but if you deal with those types of personalities on a regular basis, getting them to really have pure joy is hard. It's hard. It's hard. So it's just, it was awesome. We had another, I have another picture like this where I have a 400 pound defensive lineman that's sinking into the water, <laughs> getting crushed by a wave. I, should, I keep trying to find it. Next, you got to create bonding opportunities. These are just the little things. Working out at 6 a.m. with a staff, right? Getting tased, right? It's a bonding. I mean, Luke and, and, and Tex, they're connected for love for life, right? It's a bonding. It doesn't take much. <laughs> It doesn't take much. This was after the end of a workout. I just threw a wiffle ball on them along the deal and two bats. They drafted their own teams, and three hours later, we're still playing the championship here, freaking, you know, tape ball after a workout. Like, they just didn't want to leave. That's, that's a win as a coach. That's a win. This is a legal way for me to shoot them playing paintball. <laughs> so we went paint. We just all met up. I just arranged, a, like, a $5.00 you know, charge for it or whatever, said, I'm going to be there. Anybody wants to show up, show up. We have the whole team there. Tons of fun. This is broom ball playing hockey on an on a, on a ice rink with just broomsticks and a soccer ball. Again, tons of the same thing. Just show up, whoever wants to play. Drafting teams and had a championship. This was at, uh, after a beach workout in Florida. Um, we met up and we did a, a, a workout in the sand again. But then afterwards, we just went swimming for an hour and a half. Just fun. Dodgeball. Uh, so I, every year, everywhere I've been, we would have a killer stair workout. Every single, every single time they knew it was coming and they knew it sucked, right? And so this particular year, I had them facing me like you guys are facing me now. I'm telling them how bad it's gonna suck. I told them to charge the freaking stadium and when they did, they got pelted with dodgeballs from our staff, right? We played dodgeball. We ended up still doing the, 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 the stair workout another time. But again, curiosity and joy, we gain, we gain so much from that. Next, you gotta create one-on-ones. You gotta find ways to do this. This is Mike Rivera. Uh, Mike's sister was uh, one of the people on that, oh man, uh, one of those singing shows that Glee, right? His, uh, his sister was on Glee. Guy's a third round draft pick for the Raiders. Um, great guy, but he lived, his family was from California because his sister was on that show. They were all out there and they couldn't leave. This is the senior bowl. I found out after a long week, we're in the winter off season training, that he wasn't going to have any family there. I got in the car, drove the two and a half hours to Mobile, got a hotel room, went to practice, went to the game, loved him up, you know, nobody was there, right? Already graduated. He'd already played, right? I didn't have to do that. I was worried about the next team, right? 
But you don't think that he has roommates or friends still on the team, right? It sends a message back that you care much longer than it's a transactional, this transactional relationship of winning games. I had another player. Um, this guy was borderline mute. Wouldn't say two words. He would grunt everything. Um, play, coaches hated him. Players kind of ostracized him. Uh, couldn't get him to say a single word. One of those meetings, uh, I had saw him working on his car, and I said, you know, do you like working on cars? And he's like, mm. and I was like, all right, cool. Maybe, not, maybe you know, I got a buddy that works at NASCAR. Maybe we should go look at the car sometime. He's like, mm. right? so uh, I forgot about it. About three weeks later, he comes in my office. He's like, coach, we're gonna go look at the cars. That's a, like the longest sentence I've ever heard of someone. So the next morning I show up, 6 a.m., we're driving it to Charlotte. This dude is inner city, California, Compton, has a wife meter on, dreadlocks, a grill in, and we're going to, to, to North Carolina, right? So we get there, and I walk in, and they have all the, the fancy cars on the show. It's like you can eat off the, off the floor. So I go, like a freaking gerbil, I go to the freaking <laughs> cars, right? I'm looking at the cars. This dude goes, walks back into where all the old, fat, white mechanics were, and starts talking about manifolds and ignition times and all this crazy stuff. And they had just the best freaking time. And from that moment on, I couldn't get the kid to shut up. Like, he would just talk nonstop. Next, you got to create special workouts. I think these are, you know, obviously a lot of people do these now, but I think, again, breaking the script. That's one of them in that book, Power of Moments, breaking the script, finding ways. We you know, do some, um, Halloween workouts, we're going to dress up, have Valentine's Day massacres. I mean, that's all stuff that a lot of people do, but I think it's important that you throw them in. This was uh, after a loss. We, we, we came back, it was a nice day in Michigan. We didn't have too many of those. So we just moved away from outside. We did the workout outside, breaking the script. This was a 4th of July workout. You want to get the guys to uh, work harder, you invite the opposite sex to work out. <laughs> you have teams of uh, female and male athletes. But we'd have a fourth, we had a red, white, and blue every 4th of July. Uh, this was a midnight workout, doing all uh, kind of team-oriented deals. This was a morning, this is 5 a.m., doing all cognitive stations instead of physical. And we get everybody up on the box, and we get everybody over a line. I'm going to complete a, a puzzle, stacking plates without putting a heavier plate on top of a lighter plate. This was uh, after competitions in the morning. We had the winning team lose, uh, serving the, the losing team. I'm sorry, the losing team serving the, the winning team breakfast. Lastly here, you want to include family. This is something I didn't do a good job of early, early in my career. Um, we adopted all four of our kids, three from the Ukraine, one from Honduras. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's A, you're, 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 it's, a, it's a high charged environment. B, you can potentially get hurt right in there. Um, but I started doing it when they were about probably 10. And I just had them with me as much as they possibly could. And so this was a, this was a picture of my daughter. Um, we're about to break after a session. She's like, Dad, I want a selfie. I'm like, what's a selfie? <laughs> so she jumps up and she takes a picture with her and the team. And what, I mean, look again, what's in the background? Smiles, right? So not only do they, you know, do that kids have fun and something different, but they see me as a human being, right? It's a lot easier to get coached by a human being than a robot, right? That's my daughter. Uh, she was the DJ. My son was the videographer on Red, White, and Blue on the, on the workout. This is Keon Johnson, plays for the Detroit uh, Lions right now. This is his mom, who is a 911 dispatcher, most influential person in his life. And we would have, every Mother's Day, we'd have a Barbells and Babes workout. And the guys would invite their mom, and they would take him through a workout. And that's him loving every minute of her getting a butt kicked <laughs> in a workout. But again, how important is it to him that I'm treating his mom and including him in that journey? It's huge. Whenever you're talking about motivating the elephant, sometimes it's, it's hard, right? How do, you, how do you eat an elephant is the, is the saying, right? One bite at a time, right? You gotta shrink the change. You gotta shrink the change. So, so many times when, when you work in team sports, um, 
when you're a senior, all of a sudden you're, you're freaking knighted a leader and everybody else isn't, right? So because your parents had sex before your parents did, you're now a leader and you're not, right? It's stupid, right? So what we would do is we would shrink and change, right? Just because you know, as a freshman, right, you're, 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 you're like, oh, wow, this is, those are seniors, those are great players, how can I ever be? We would have freshman leadership, sophomore leadership, junior leadership, senior leadership, right? And we would use pop culture to shrink the change and, and use that to keep their attention. So we would use Band of Brothers with the freshmen. <coughs> we'd take a, a, a clip from that and we would talk about the leadership principles in there. And we would have them lead something to, in front of the whole team. So they would get used to being in front of the guys. Because what happens in football, it's like in life, right? That sometimes when you go out there with your starting 11, it's not all seniors. A lot of times there's a freshman out there as well. Lastly, here you got to shape the path. Tweaking the environment. So a lot of people will start with like when you get a new gym or, you know, uh, you think that it's ultimately going to be, uh, you know, just moving stuff around. Like they'll move stuff around and it's like, oh, cool, whole new environment. It doesn't start with your, your resources. It doesn't start with the external. It starts with the internal. The first thing you have to focus on is your staff or the people that you surround yourself with. So I use this personality profile. How many people have taken like um, Myers-Briggs or um, you know, any of the other personality tests, right? The one that I use is Gary Smiley. It's, it's actually used for marriage counseling. That's where I found it. Um, when we, my wife and I were going through our, our, our kind of our marriage counseling on the front end of getting married. In that, you're one of four things. You're like, I'm a dumbbell coach, right? So, like, I gotta keep it simple. So, you're one of four things. They're all positive and they're all negative. They're all leaders and they're all, they're, they all need to be followers. I'm a, a lion. A lion is somebody that likes to be up front, likes to pound their chest, is a vision caster. I'm way more comfortable in this setting than I am with you one on one. 100%, right? My, my detriment is details. I am terrible, terrible with details. I was just speaking not too long ago in Puerto Rico, and I was um, in the middle of the presentation. I was trying to reference the freaking conference, and I finally just had to stop and ask, like, where the hell am I at? You know, that's, I mean, that's how bad I can be, right? So I need to have a beaver, somebody that's meticulous, that puts everything in the spot, right? So if you're somebody that has 20 different to-do lists, you're a beaver, right? You're meticulous. You've got a plan for every single contingency. Your problem is typically that you don't like to be up front. You don't like to be the one that's pounding your chest. The otter is the playful one, right? So when the music comes on, the people that dance, they're typically otters, right? The people that can change the culture, the environment, those are otters. But they're not the ones you necessarily want handling your discipline, right? Your retriever is your typical offensive lineman that just, you know, um, wants to lead by example. They don't want any attention. They just they, they want to do their job because they feel like they do their job well, other people will follow, right? When I was a young coach, I felt like I was a pretty good coach because I had had success, right? I was a lion, so what do you think that I hired? I hired lions, right? What happens when you put two lions in a cage? Freaking fight, right? If I like cats, you know, if I like cats, right? So, you, I had to learn that I needed to hire for my weakness. When you are a young coach or a young professional, just because I'm a, a lion doesn't mean that I, I've got to completely abandon details or that I can't, that I, I have to, I, I don't have, I'm never going to be in a position where I have to change the, the environment, right? Or that I need to be the, just the loyal soldier and not, you know, buck the system, right? I need to work on all those skills. So when you're young, you need to work on everything, right? When you go to take a job, find out what they're looking for. If they're looking for something, they're like, ask them what they liked about the last person. Oh, I like that he created energy, or you know, I like that he was very organized. Would you not like? Well, this, this dude would freaking bounce off the walls all the damn time. Well, you better not be an otter in the interview if you put that job. Or better yet, you better realize that that's maybe not the place for you to work because it's not where you're going to be the most successful. When you're ahead or you're the leader, hire your weaknesses. 
Hire what you're not good at. That's how the best have always done it. Then you can look at the environment, right? So this was our weight room in Tennessee. You know, obviously the environment does make a difference, right? So you want to provide that. The one thing that I would always do is anytime that there was a break, a Christmas break, a spring break, anything like that, I would set money aside so I was always adding something. You know, even if it was something simple like new collars or you know, a new stereo system or something, whatever. I would always make sure that we're adding something just so that they felt like there was uh, growth. This was our nutrition bar. When I, it actually, it wasn't even that. It was like basically just a room. That was what it started with when I said we want to do something nutritionally. I, to change it, I just put up a picture of this. I had a, a mock-up artist draw this. I put it on an easel. I put it out in the weight room. And every time somebody walked by, I'd be like, yeah, that's what we're going to get someday. And, the, and so the AD would start walking people by and say, that's what we're going to get someday. And eventually, the right person walked by, and they gave us the money to get it. Right? So you just gotta, you gotta, you gotta put it out there. This is bad form, so don't grade the form, but when I first got to Eastern Michigan, this is, to put it in perspective, this team had not had a winning season in 30 years. I left the Cincinnati Bengals where we just got out and done um, playing in the divisional playoff game. Um, and I went up there, and some people run from bad stuff. I, it, uh, Ann and I were talking earlier, you know, I, to me, you don't throw a light into the light, you throw a light into the darkness. If you're, if you're a coach, you know, and you're just going somewhere where you know it's going to be easy street, that's, you're not a coach, right? If you're going to go into a situation where, like, people run from that, so I, that excited me, to go into a place that I hadn't won, to see if I could actually put this framework in place, right, that, along with the head coach. When I first got there, guys would be maxing, and there was no energy. Nobody would say anything. The spotter would be like, yeah, come on. It was, it was painful, right? Until we eventually got to a point where the, if somebody was going for their personal best, the freaking room stopped and they were all around them. In fact, one time when they, were, they pissed me off so bad that they weren't supporting one another, I took them out to the basketball game, kicked the band off the court for halftime, and took them out and made them compete in front of the fans at the basketball game just because I wanted them getting used to competing in front of people and giving energy. Lastly, you got to build habits. So Dak Prescott, so I'm sure there's probably Cowboy fans in here, maybe not. But you guys remember when he had the, the, he threw the Gatorade cup and he missed a trash can, and he went and he picked it up and threw it away, and it was on freaking ESPN for that? How bad is that? Right? Matt Bayless is a, one of my best friends. He was a strength coach at, at Mississippi State when Dak was there. And, he, and, and I remember going down and visiting him, and there was a time when their nutrition bar the guys had been throwing crap all over the, the field and not throwing it away. And so they locked up the nutrition bar. And he wanted to motivate a bunch of fat linemen to take away their nutrition bar. And all of a sudden, the quarterbacks, they start doing the right thing, right? So I know that there was habits that were being built and surrounded back with that eventually got to a point where he's getting national recognition as bad as it is on ESPN for going and actually doing what he should be doing. Lastly, you got to rally the herd. This would be a competition that we would do every year. We'd draft teams. We'd, we'd have, you know, we'd grade every workout, plus zero minus. Zero meant you did exactly what you're supposed to do. Plus means that you motivated people beyond yourself. They worked above the, the percentages that you should. Negative um, was that you were a distraction. You were working consistently below. Um, we would grade every single workout. We'd put it up. You know, the guys would be able to come in and they are able to see right away that a risky had a red. The peer accountability to that was so important. Like even before I would get to that kid, Hunter Andrews would go and take, who Hunter about plays for Oakland right now, um, would go and take care of it for me. You know, and so you want to rally your troops. You want to rally the, the gym. You want to rally their, their peers to take care of the small stuff so you can stay focused on the big stuff. Lastly, you got to keep the switch going. So I told you about Eastern Michigan hadn't won uh, in 30 years. Um, you know, not a, a winning season. They had when we got there, 78 players were on the team. 56 of them tested positive for drugs. We had um, a team GPA of 1.9. There had been a racism incident on campus. A player had been murdered the year before. 
uh, from the surrounding area, was being in the wrong place at the wrong time, and the coach had been fired for verbal abuse. About as bad of a culture as you could possibly have. And so those eight kings, uh, we don't have all eight guys in there, but these are those eight guys. Uh, this guy's a starting guard for Kansas City, starting defensive end for uh, Tampa Bay, also a lineman for Tampa Bay, Pittsburgh, Pirate, uh, Pittsburgh Steelers, owns a business that is, uh, just went into their 11th state uh, distribution. He's a um, financial planner, and he's a, a, an NCO um, officer. These guys rallied the team, and they're, now they're on their fourth of five straight years in the bowl game, or, or being bowl eligible. So my point is this, the framework works um, if you put it in your consistent. That's my information. I don't know, I don't know where we're at time-wise, but, um, but I'll be around. Thanks so much. Right on time.